Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Well. I'm well, thank you. Yes, I am. Okay. We thank you, Father God, for this day, another opportunity to assemble in your house, Father God, with your family. We thank you for revealing yourself in, unto us in a fresh, new way today. You are our master teacher, Father, so repeat after me. My eyes are open, My eyes are open. and I see your perfect will. My ears are open, and I hear your voice clearly. My heart is open, and I do what you tell me, when you tell me, in the name of Jesus, and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, we, you do realize we need the Holy Spirit's help in everything, yes? At no point should you ever in your life take credit for anything. I mean nothing because it is he who is at work in us and through us to both will and do of his good pleasure, which means that we can't take credit for anything. Not a thing. All the glory belongs to him. Okay, so what I'm going to do is pick up on the teaching that we had started a couple weeks ago. We're actually going to start here. Are we, it's coming up all right? Okay. Because um, I pulled some additional information and I'm just going to track at a decent pace and then after each um, segment, <coughs> excuse me, because I have a few segments in here, um, a few things that I'm going to approach through the slides. So after each segment is when I'll ask you to then ask me questions that you have about each segment. Because as I was developing this, the Holy Spirit had me asking certain questions only because he wanted to make sure I had the answer captured in here. Okay, so as I was going along, then questions would come up and he'd direct me to the answer. Question would come up, he'd direct me to the answer. So let's get through the segment. Then if you have additional questions, we can answer them. Make sense? Because you might ans ask questions for which there's already an answer, but if we have to keep stopping, we might need to get to it. <laughs> okay, so we had touched on Pentagram, and we're dealing with um, symbols and the meaning that um, a lot of them hold. I think that last time when we had touched on it, we ended with uh, the importance of not keeping, really they're just called idols, trinkets and things like that that you might pick up and bring back from travels, or sometimes people might travel and bring things back. Um, or they may just give you things, but then you don't even have to travel anymore to have access to those things. All you have to do is shop. Okay, because those countries and their symbolism and idols and things like that have infiltrated the United States. Okay, and then of course there are people who transplant from those places to the United States, and so when their culture comes with them, then all the other stuff attached to it comes with them too. So we need to understand that, and that's because when we, let's turn to it, because all of this is coming out of, it's the first time that I actually dealt with it this way, um, but all of this is coming out of Matthew 13, when he talks about the tares, yes? And that's because we had stated that, well, first of all, let me ask you, in Bible time, when it came to those who were religious or not, or Christian or whatever, does anybody know what the three main classes of people were, not economic classes, but in terms of religiously, do we know what the three main classes of people were? They're actually referenced in scripture when it speaks of 
for instance, Paul. Do we know why Paul, one of his main assignments, do we know why he was called one of his main assignments? Do we know who he was called to minister to? Gentiles, Gentiles because Peter wasn't. Okay, so Gentiles is one class of, of people. Who's another class? There are three main classes, Jews and then Christians. Christians and Jews are not synonymous. So Gentiles, Jews, Christians, three classes of people. There are also in end time, in eternity, there are three destinations. Do we know what those are? Heaven. Heaven. Earth. And the lake of fire. Because death and hell are being cast into the lake of fire. So lake of fire is final destination. So three classes of people, Gentiles, Jews, born again believers, let me put it that way, because God never called us Christians. The Greeks did. God never called us, Jesus never even called us Christians. All right, so we have Gentiles, Jews, and then what scripture more accurately calls disciples. The initial 12 disciples, Jesus also called his apostles. But then upon his ascension, they were referred to, actually at that point, it eventually coming, ended up coming down to 11 of them. They were referred to as the apostles. And then all the other followers of Christ, anyone who came to know Christ, they called disciples. So then we should be calling ourselves one, disciples of Christ, and then two, more importantly, I believe, sons of God. Yes, when we are a son of God and you own that, then you will be a disciple. But we're first called sons, all right? And then three destinations, heaven, earth, lake of fire. Heaven will be for those who are first fruit. They've received the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and have judged themselves rightly in this life because it is possible for someone to neglect and lose their salvation. They can. God doesn't take it. Jesus doesn't take it. But it is possible for one through bad judgment in this life to lose their salvation, to lose their position eternally. And scripture tells us that. It is possible. Which is why he tells us that we should judge ourselves and make the necessary adjustments, that we should not transgress our righteousness. And that's what Pastor more specifically called it, Pastor Ron, he said, for us now, it's not a matter of sin, but one can transgress their righteousness. Okay, and they can, they can lose their eternal place with him, although they've received him. Okay, so when we receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, when he says, make your calling and election sure, he means toe the line and hold yourself accountable all the way to the end in order to ensure your eternal position, all right? So, heaven, then there's earth, those who are not first fruit. Perhaps they received Jesus as Lord and Savior, but then they rejected the Holy Spirit. And then, lake of fire, are those who reject the whole package. Don't want God, don't want Jesus, and don't want the Holy Ghost. And so the lake of fire is where they'll go. Now, for those who have rejected Christ and have died, where are they? No, they are in hell. 
Hell is holding. Nobody's in the lake of fire now. Okay? Hell is holding. So for those who have died without Christ, they are in hell, which means they are eternally separated from God. Can't fix that. Okay? For those who have died in Christ, they're not, according to Jesus, they're not dead. They're asleep in Christ. Then where are they? Paradise. Paradise. Because nobody is in heaven but Jesus. And he's waiting for God to release him to come back. Because even Jesus said in the Gospels, he doesn't know and the angels don't even know when God is going to release him to come back to rapture the church. He just knows that when he says go, he goes. Okay, so for recap, three destinations are heaven, earth, Three classes of people are? And in this day and age, there's of course the born again believer. People call them Christians, but they're born again believer. I mean born again meaning receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, baptized in water in the name of Jesus, and baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. All right? So that whole package, they've received the whole package then they would be then what bound? Heaven bound, okay? For the ones who perhaps they're baptized, may have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, have not received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, they could be what? Earthbound. Earthbound. And for the ones who've rejected Christ altogether, then they are? Either in the lake of fire or headed there unless they change it. All right? Okay, but our assignment is to make our calling and election sure. Yes? Because in Matthew 13, he talks about in 37. 36 says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is who? The Son of Man. And he says the field is the? World. The good seed are the? Children of the kingdom. Okay? But the tares are who? The children of the wicked one. Now, when he talks about Further up in the chapter, when it refers to the ones who hear, but the seed falls by the wayside, then you have some who fall among the rock slash thorn, right? Then you have some who fall among the thorns, or rock slash stone, is what I meant to say, rock slash stone, and then some who fall among the thorns. Answer me this. The wayside, excuse me, the wayside, the stony, and the thorn, are those the same as the tares? Explain. So, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I didn't want to be yelling in the mic, sorry. So, I feel like from what we've been reading and what I have in my notes, like the tares are like people who just completely reject all of it. Like they're not willing to be persuaded. They don't believe at all. But I feel like the different variations, like the wayside and the stony and the thorny, like those are variations of like people who are supposed to be in the ministry because they can be people who like do believe, but they're not fully persuaded or they're constantly backsliding and stuff. So those are not necessarily people who don't believe at all. They kind of like are one foot in, one foot out type of people. Okay. Yeah. So the the wayside, the stony, those type of people, they could very well be Christians. They just aren't, they operate in iniquity and they are not, like she said, fully persuaded. Um, they could very much so be in the church, but they just aren't there yet. Um, and 
the tares are people who were purposefully planted by the devil. <laughs> they were not, um, they're, they're not at any point children of the kingdom yet until they are converted. If they choose to be. Okay, so the passage then goes back to the three classes of people. Okay, so the tares would be synonymous in that time with the Gentile, which then is synonymous with this time, unsaved. Have completely rejected God. All right, however, yes, to Mason's point, you can have wayside folk in the church, thorny people in the church, and stony people in the church, okay? And some of them could have perhaps received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, all right? And maybe at one point they spoke in tongues, all right? But they are not rooted and grounded, and that's because there is a clear distinction between those that hear, but they don't produce fruit, and then the one in the good ground, the good seed in the good ground, all right? So those are the ones who are not only filled with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, but then they are a living witness as to the power of the Holy Spirit. He allows them, allows, they allow the Holy Spirit to access their life and transform it. Because change is important, all right? So, with that as a backdrop, hence now the teaching, and that's because the adversary would try, and unfortunately for some he has succeeded, with taking that good seed and the person by an act of their will opens themselves up to corruption. Okay, now, we're all familiar with this, yeah? Okay, history. And some of this is gonna be history, but I want you to make the connection because this is all tied into tears and how it presents itself, all right? The reason why we do not use the five-point star is because its origin is from ancient Greece and Babylon. And we're all familiar with one of the kings who reigned over Babylon, right? And he was King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? An idol worshiper. This is captured from one of the artifacts that they found in that territory. And you'll see, of course, where the five star is a part of that attire, I guess, for that false god. All right. The pentagram was known to the ancient Greeks with a depiction on a vase, possibly dating back to 7th century BC. All right. Pith pronounce it again. Pythagoras. See, some reason my mind is just rejecting the proper pronunciation of this man's name, but I guess I shouldn't give him that much credit anyhow, okay? Um, so, and he uh, was a philosopher, okay, Greek philosopher, and he's the one who actually, I believe, originated the star overlaying the man inside the circle. He is the origin of that symbol. Okay, now that same star is used in witchcraft, all right? So that's a reason why here in this ministry, and we have to thank Sister Janet, she's not in the room right now, I don't think, but she's the one who um, does a lot of our fellowship hall decorations and such. Um, and of course, one of the conversations we had was that we don't do five point stars over there. All right, and that's for this reason. You'll also notice that the bottom one is used most often in the symbol for the Eastern Star, which is, that was the quote unquote fraternity um, or secret um, order that was a spinoff of the Freemasons, okay? The men had theirs, so the woman decided they need to have their own 
all right? However, it is demonic, people, okay? It's demonic. Um, I'm not gonna necessarily go through and read all this. I just put more so the history on here so at least I'd have the documentation, all right? However, that symbol also is used in astronomy um, and they're indicating that Venus apparently forms the symbol of a five star, the five pointed star as it orbits. And they say that when they track where it goes that it forms a five point star. However, that does not surprise me because if there's any aspect of truth to that, we have to remember that Lucifer is the god of the world. Evil exists now, but there will come a time when evil will no longer exist. And so this will be of no value, okay? But for now, evil exists. So that's the one thing that we still have to remember. However, I'm bringing this up and that's because, especially in this day and time, we have a lot of people who worship earth and stars and moon and sun and all this nonsense. And they put a lot of stock in events that occur and they're attempting to utilize the stars to either make sense of past or future. And this is what the word has to say about that. Let's read, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. Continue. And hath gone and served other gods and worshiped them, either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven, and it be told, which I have not commanded, and it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel. Then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which hath committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they die. Now, this is, God's, this is how God thinks about it. Now, mind you, back in that day and time, people were stoned to death for it. Do you necessarily see that happening today? Okay, so perhaps God's approach to it is different because of course we're living now under the dispensation of grace but it doesn't mean that he is okay with it. People will still pay the price for that. It's just that we don't take them in the middle of the city and stone them to death. Okay? However, God's position on it is still the same. All right? Now, Star of David. If we were to use a star, it would be this, okay, if we were to use one. However, as I go through this element, don't think that this is a license to go purchase a bunch of stuff with Star David all over it. No more than you don't see a cross in this church, do you? Okay, because we don't utilize that as a symbol, as a symbol for our sonship either. It's actually symbolic of the curse. not salvation. So you will not find me wearing a cross, you will not find one in my house, and you will not find one in here. Because it is not a symbol of sonship, okay? However, if one uses it, of course that's the national flag for the Jews in Israel. Blue stripes are intended to symbolize the stripes on the tallit, which is what's next to it. The 
cloth there that you see, and you see a man who's draped in it. Of course, this is also what um, Moses was wrapped in when he was found, all right? Traditional Jewish prayer shawl. So you'll see that that's represented there, okay? When it comes to Israel, we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem because God himself established this nation and its people as his bride and made a promise to them. Let's read this together. Can you read it? Can you see it okay? Okay. Read from verse one, ready, read. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Continue. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padanaram and blessed him. And God said unto him, thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. Continue. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Continue. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So you're going to see that the people of Israel, that's God's bride. All right, so regardless of what you see in the news or what you hear, don't, don't rely on that and don't engage in conversation about that because it could likely turn into an argument or debate. You need to know how God sees them and he loves them. He's called them his bride. And so our job is to intercede for them, not talk about the situation. Okay, and that's because God had indicated from the very beginning, let's see if I can find it here. The war and the bloodshed and all of that that you see over there. Let's see here. Okay, well, starting in, it's not what I'm looking for yet. I'll find it, but turn to Genesis 17. Genesis 
Genesis 17. Okay, are you there in 17? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, let's start from 10. Elder Bernie, can you please read starting from verse 10 until I stop you? This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall, shall bear unto thee. At this set time in the next year. Okay, so we can stop there. So we can see that the chosen seed is who? Isaac. However, God will still bless Ishmael because he's the seed of Abraham, okay? Now, all the war that you see over in the Middle East, go to Genesis 16. Verse 16, Elder B, can you read from verse eight, please? And he said, Agar, Sarai's maid, which cameth thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. 
And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So therein lies your answer. They will always be opposed and always oppose. Always. And that's because the interesting thing is when it talked about 12 princes coming out of him, 12 tribes came out of Ishmael just like 12 tribes came out of Isaac. But 12 were of God and the other 12 were not. Which again speaks to the adversary always trying to corrupt. He tries to copy what God has done and corrupt it. 12? Really? When there are 12 of the tribe of Judah? Really? Okay. So, why do some use the Star of David um, to symbolize their faith? Because Jesus was a Jew. Okay? Of the line of Jesse. All right? And we have scripture here that can validate this. I'm just going to read verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This was prophesied. All right? And then in Matthew 1, 6, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. We also see in Ruth that same, and the woman her neighbors gave it a name, saying there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. And Solomon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. All right? And then in Revelations, and one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, taking a little, you know, I went and, of course, did some history. There's a lot of controversy regarding the six-point star being attributed to the Jews. However, I did find this interesting. And that is, apparently, the star of David was identified on a shield that David used. And David D in the Hebrew is that symbol that you see up there. They call it Dalet. Of course, the Greek alphabet and what is used in mythology is a very sharp edge version of the Dalet, but upside down. What I also found interesting is that all the letters in Dalet are also in Delta. I looked at that thing and I was like, well then, okay. Um, so this also is what historians and excavators believe that that six point star encompassed. And that is when you break it up, it captures all the 12 tribes of Israel inside one star. Okay, so I, I don't find that unreasonable. We'll put it that way. But it doesn't mean that I'm gonna get a whole bunch of stars of David and put them all throughout the house. All right, okay. Now, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, well, let's just do this real quick. Question. Or let me take questions, yes. So is there an exception? Because like on the, our, our flag, like that flag right there, it's got stars on it. Is there an exception for the American flag or is it? We just do that because we are in this country and it's our job to pray for it. Okay. And so our only connection to this country we could use would be through that flag. Okay. Do so I put okay. one in my house? No. 
Okay. Do I put one on the back of my car? No. And that's because I'm first a child of God. I just happen to be operating here for now. All right. But since we are in the United States of America, we are charged with praying for this nation. And that's because we are the reason why the nation hasn't just been balled up in a, in a box and thrown into the pit of hell. That's right. right. Let's not forget that. The church is the stabilizing force. I don't care what anybody says. And when I say the church, I mean God's church is the stabilizing force. So do not underestimate your position as a son of God and then the power that you've been given through the Holy Spirit. And that's because he uses us to affect change until he decides that our job is done and then he leaves it to, and he leaves all the people to their devices. But until such time, our job is to convert as many tares over to good seed as we can. Yes. Yes. Yes, uh, you mentioned the Eastern Stars and the Masons. You said it was an order? Yes. And um, Hebrews 7 chapter, I mean Hebrews chapter 7 verse 17 states that Jesus was a priest of the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. So what order does that follow? Oh, the priest of the order of Melchizedek is God's order. He established that, okay? Freemason and Eastern Star was not established by God. So all you need to do is just start at the very beginning in terms of who was the author. God was the author of Melchizedek. And actually I have a, they want to call it Jesus' genealogy. They don't really have it, but I guess they couldn't come up with a better word. Um, but yeah. The Freemason, Eastern Star, Illuminati, any secret society like that, those are all man-made, not God-made. Man-made, all right? Now, when it comes to genealogy, um, Elder Ron, can you please turn to Luke 3? Elder Bernie, can you please turn to Matthew 1? And the rest of you can turn to those as well, because I want for you to follow along with me. Luke 3, Luke chapter 3, and then Matthew chapter 1. And I do have information in here on Freemason. I didn't go that much into the Eastern Star, and that's because it's basically a copy of the Freemason, it's just the same thing for women. Um, but I do have information in here to cover that as well. Okay, uh, let's start with Luke chapter three, verse 23 through 38. Now, if you all wanna focus up on this screen and you can kind of track it, while Elder Bernie reads, starting on your left for Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 38, when you got it. <coughs> Do we have a mic? We need a mic. Thank you. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, Heli, which was the son of Bethat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Jana, which was the son of Joseph. Okay, pause just for a minute. Now, folks, if you're looking at the slide, you need to go down to the bottom and then read your way up. <laughs> okay, continue. Which was the son of Matthias, which was the son of Amos, which was the son of Nahum, which was the son of, son of Ezli, which was the son of Nagai, which was the son of Math, which was the son of Matthias, which was the son of Semi, 
which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of jo jo Joanna, which was the son of Re Resa, <laughs> which was the son of Zerubbabel, <laughs> which was the son of <coughs> Salathiel. See, she did this on purpose. <coughs> which was the son of Neri, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Adai, which was the son of Kosum, which was the son of Elmodum, which was the son of Ur, which was the son of Jose, Jose, which was the son of Eliezer, which was the son of Jerim, which was the son of Mathat, which was the son of Levi, <coughs> which was the son of Simeon, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Joseph, <coughs> which was the son of Jonan, which was the son of Eliakim, which was the son of Melea, which was the son of Menon, which was the son of Matatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David, which was the son of Jesse, which was the son of Obed, which was the son of Boaz, which was the son of Salmon, which was the son of Nisan, which was the son of Amenadab, which was the son of Aram, which was the son of Ezram, which was the son of Phares, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham, which was the son of Thara, which was the son of Nacor, which was the son of Saruk, which was the son of Ragu, which was the son, <laughs> it's in there, <coughs> which, which was the son of Phelek, which was the son of Heber, which was the son of Salah, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Sem, which was the son of Noah, which was the son of Lamech, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Melil, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Okay, so the slight discrepancy that you're seeing is between the Greek and the Hebrew, okay? Um, no more than my name, N-I-C-O-L-E, wouldn't be spelled the same way in Spanish or French or whatever, okay? So you're going to see that's the genealogy on Joseph's side, husband of Mary. So he came out of the line of Judah as well. It's from David, but you'll find that Joseph, Mary, the ones espoused to each other, they both came through the line of David, but through two separate sons. Yes. Um, so basically the whole planet um, was populated by Noah's three sons, right? When they, when we had, when God had to basically start over and there was the flood, right. the only living family was Noah and his sons and their wives and everything else started over mm -hmm. from them. Okay, so Japheth, he, okay, so Japheth was the, the island of the Gentiles, right? J who? Japheth. In chapter 10. What Genesis. was the name? Genesis. Genesis chapter 10, okay. it says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Right. And Which unto them him. were sons born after the flood. Mm -hmm. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Maida, and Javan, and Tubal. Okay, any name that you see there that's not on here, that means that they're not included, so to speak, in the lineology of Jesus Christ. Okay, but I, what I was getting at was Ham. What nation does he fall up under? I'd have to go back and do all the tracking again as to exactly what nation he was over. Yeah, I have to go back and refresh my memory every time. All right. Um, but here's what you'll see with the genealogy that both are coming out of the line of Judah, the tribe of Judah. And that's the distinction that I want to make. What I do find interesting is that, who was Solomon's mother? Mm -hmm. 
So, here he takes a woman who he falls in love with when she's taking a bath, okay? And he steals her, murders her husband. You just talk about a bad scenario. But then out of that is Mary who carries the savior of the world. Out of that jacked up mess. <laughs> it's right here. It's gonna be on your left, because it's gonna come down. All right, and then Elder Bernie, can you find at least where you can pick up where it says Solomon? Okay. All right, um, or from Jacob up to to Solomon, because now we're talking about Mary's side. Okay, and that's Matthew one and verse seven. Mm hmm. Well, verse six. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Roboam, and Roboam begat Abia, and Abia begat Asa, and Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Joatham, and Joatham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manassas, and Manassas begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias, and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadoc, and Sadoc begat Achim, and Achim begat Iliud, and Iliud begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Okay. Well, the thing is, Joseph came out of Nathan's line. All right. Mary came out of Solomon's line. <laughs> and then she's the one who is the birth child of Jesus Christ. And it's important that we notice this because you'll notice that Jesus is not coming out of Joseph's line. And that's because his father is God. All right. So the only person really who was involved in this would be Mary. All right. And you'll get a little treat in July because there's a video that will show within the love cells that affirms this. But this is just also to show you in a visual and to reinforce that Jesus indeed was a Jew. However, his intent was for the Jews to not just subscribe to the letter of the old law, but to receive the rhema of his word. All right? So those Jews who are still rejecting the Holy Spirit, that's not what God wanted. That's why he sent Jesus the way he did in the fashion that he did to rewrite that in terms of how the Jews should approach now salvation. And that is, it's not according to the letter and it's not according to the old law. It's according to the new covenant that Jesus established when he came. So is there anything wrong with someone being a Jew? If you're a Holy Ghost, spirit filled, tongue talking, fire baptized, water baptized Jew, go on ahead. As long as you understand 
that the Holy Spirit is essential. Okay? So you can't just stay a Jew and not recognize the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, this just captures now the 12 tribes coming out of Abraham. Um, and you'll see over to your right that Jacob, J Jacob Buddha, basically had four wives, or yeah, I believe they were considered wives. Um, Zilpah, Leah, Rachel, Bilhah. Now the unattractive one though, that he worked, he worked for the pretty one. And that was, who was that? Rachel. Rachel, okay. But he ended up getting the unattractive one, who is? Notice where the tribe of Judah comes out of. Leah is the one who gave birth to Judah. Okay. However, you've got your 12 tribes represented there across four different women. Okay. So that's just there. All right. And then, of course, we reinforce Revelations 22, 16, where Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He said that. I am that. All right? Yes. So when we're referring to Jews, like as modern day today type Jews, are those the persons who still live in Israel? Like who would they be classified as? Because you know, it's like they have the Jews that they talk about from like the Holocaust and all these different things. So just the Differential. I don't understand exactly who they would be or it what they be, classify as. Jews out. can be anyone who survived the Holocaust. It mm -hmm. could be anyone who lives in Israel. It could be anyone who's living here. Okay. They're all over. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're all over. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in Israel, there are three main classifications of people over there, and that is Christians, Jews, and Islam. And the only reason why Islam and their, their, their population over there is pretty high, okay? The only reason why is because those are coming out of the seed of Ishmael. That's right. Okay, so I understand that Jesus came through this lineage in order to bring salvation, but as far as us, we are the elect of Christ and we were predestined. What does it mean to be the elect of Christ? And as far as predestination, does that mean that, that doesn't mean that, you know, he knows everybody that will be saved, correct? He knows that he knows the final outcome for everyone. Mm-hmm. For only you. because he knows what they will decide. Right, okay. Whether they will accept or whether they will reject. It's not he knows the outcome because he's established the outcome. Mm -hmm. No, he just knows because he knows what they're gonna decide. Okay, so what does it mean to be elect? That, that's my question. Elect would be considered your first fruit. First fruit, and that's because remember, who is the bride? Israel is the bride. But then who is the body? We are the body, okay? So when he calls us elect, he's calling about those who now have embraced the gift of the Holy Spirit, and I mind you, with proof, which means with the evidence of speaking in tongues. One does not have the Holy Spirit if they do not speak in tongues, all right? So the evidence of speaking in tongues, the Holy Spirit, baptism in the name of Jesus, which then is in agreement with New Testament, all right? And then, of course, acknowledging Jesus as Lord and Savior. He says, no man comes to the Father but by me. me, Jesus Christ. So receive Jesus, water baptism, infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit before or after baptism, doesn't matter, as long as you get all three. However, you can't initiate the process without first accepting Jesus. So then we would then be called his elect, he calls us, he, he even calls us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation. He calls us a lot of things, okay? He calls us sons, okay? He calls us first fruit, 
all right? But there's a reason why he does all of those things, and that's because he also wants us to understand that we receiving the full package is essential. He, the Holy, Jesus that is, Jesus had to receive the Holy Spirit for himself in order to even be ascended. So what makes us think that we don't have to? That's right. Amen. Okay, I think there was one question over here, and then. I'm just curious, um, could you explain Revelation uh, chapter three, verse 14? Which says? And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, said the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Okay, what exactly are you needing for me to explain? Are you saying it, you want for you want for me to explain what now? Yes, well, I mean, I guess could you put this verse in context or explain or break it down? What uh, well, it's I mean, saying? This was just a letter that was um, given to was it John when he received a vision concerning heaven. Um, I'm not necessarily going to go into Revelations today, but that entire book um, speaks. It, it actually covers things in past, present, and future. And John was given this, I guess it, it was like a, um, it was like a vision, um, a vision and it gave understanding about past, about present, also about future events, things to expect. Now, when one reads the book of Revelation, because this is, uh, it's, it's almost like a movie to me, okay? Um, it's almost like it was shown to him in frames or something, okay? So when Jesus is giving him this vision and he's showing him these frames, you have to understand that you can't read Revelation without also reading Daniel because they go together. Okay, you cannot read one book without the other. All right, and that's a whole other teaching. Yes. Um, I was just going to ask, like, um, at one po what point in Jesus' life when he was on earth did he receive, you know, the um, infilling of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues, and how did that whole process look like? What did that process look like? I am, I have not found in scripture yet exactly where it occurred. However, mm -hmm. my thinking is it may have been in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified. And that's because he would have had to have had it in order to be raised from the dead. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to answer this. But so as far as like why the infilling of having the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues is important in this life, it's so that we can communicate intimately with God, correct? It's to be able to communicate with him, to be able to do what it is that he has assigned us to do, because we can't do it without his power and his help. Right. And to be raptured. Okay, so as far as like in our next life, will it be as essential then? Yeah, there won't even be a need for it. Okay, because that's what I was wondering. Because tells us that the tongues would cease. Mm -hmm. So after the church is raptured, that'll need, that won't even be available anymore. Okay. Gift of the Holy Spirit is for our benefit for this time. When the church is raptured, it will not be offered anymore. So no one will have the ability to even receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there will be those who will go through the tribulation. Their chance for receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit is over. And they have, in essence, sealed their eternity in that sense. Yes. In Acts 2.33, although it does not specifically say when it took place, but it did take place nonetheless. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, 
and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. And see, this is the thing. Um, that day of Pentecost, remember when we had said that, think about the people who lived before Jesus came, okay? So we'll just start from Noah's time and even before Noah, um, because the Bible talks about it, that even those people who were in the days of Noah and they perished and they were eternally separated from God because they rejected him, okay? When Christ died and he was, he was crucified, he died, he went into hell to minister to those souls that were in prison. So that included everybody who had died up to then and they had rejected Christ he went and ministered to them in hell to give them an opportunity to come to him in hell now, I don't know how many souls that is okay but that is from the beginning of time, from when mankind was on earth, and they died before the time of Jesus. When Jesus died, he went to hell for any of them who went to hell, and he ministered to them there and offered them salvation. Okay? And brought them now back into paradise. Now, I believe that that day at Pentecost, I believe that those who he brought from hell who received him received the gift of the Holy Spirit that day. Because they cannot be resurrected without it. That day. So it wasn't just the people in that room physically. Yes, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to piggyback off of the question that she asked about Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit. Yes. Um, I don't know, but I was just um, thinking back about the scripture in Matthew chapter 3 mm -hmm. when the dove ascended upon him and before he went into, um, was tempted. So that's just my thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other, I, had, I do have a question um, regarding the scripture you read earlier in Psalms 122 verse 6 where it says pray for the peace of Jerusalem mm -hmm. and they shall prosper that love thee mm -hmm. I guess my question is how is that going to come about how is the what aspect of it praying for the peace how is that peace going to come about that well, God is asking us to pray for the peace? Right. Basically what he's, what the Holy Spirit is wanting for us to do is to continue to intercede for Israel so that in what way God can move in that territory that he will be able to do that. But of course, ultimately the true peace will not come until the end. Which is why he talks about the new Jerusalem descending from heaven. Okay? That's when the true peace will occur. However, between then and now, there will be Jews who will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They will. And so that is what our intercession needs to be for. 
because they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and although with the news, they're generally only going to broadcast all the bad and all the negative. And so we just have to trust that as we intercede, that it is affecting positive change, even though the news might not broadcast it. Amen. Amen. All right. However, the ultimate peace, the true peace, will not be until the end. Pastor, thank you for the teaching. I, this is personal, Sister Karen. I, I need to some of the, some of the things I have I've missed. Some of the some of the teaching I've missed some of the words. But my question to you is, and I'm not knocking anybody that's asking any question, but this is for me. What uh, I need to know this information. I understand. I need to understand about the the, the stars and things. But I need to know the information of the genealogy. Am I pronouncing it of Jesus? Because I mean, tell me that. I need. I need me for me. I need to know that. Right. But us, because of what reason I need to know that? Do I need to know that for, so I can know for my righteousness? No. If you're asked about it. Okay. If you're questioned about it. Okay. For example, did you know that Jesus was a Jew? Do I know what? Did you know Jesus was a Jew? I did not know that, but okay. I also hear you said that Jews were the ones that were rejected by God. I mean, that rejected God, not rejected by God. They rejected the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Right. And then Jesus was a Jew, and, and it just, it's just kind of, and, I, and some other things you taught us today, mm -hmm. and I'm sure everybody got it, but I think I kind of missed something, and I just don't understand if he's a Jew, and, and the Jews are the ones that rejected the Holy Spirit. How does that connect, to my, connect that for right. me? And that's why he references it so much in Scripture, where he talks about, how much the Jews took for granted, okay, mm -hmm. when it came to salvation, okay? And they so much harped on the law of Moses that they completely bypassed Jesus and his new covenant, okay? So when approached about it, because you likely will be, especially by anyone who's contemplating or has already made a decision to convert to Islam. Okay, yeah. Which is growing in this country. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So you need to know where you stand and understand that if they say, well, Jesus was a Jew. Well, if you don't know he was a Jew, the first thing you might say is, no, he wasn't. Right. That's what I would have said. He was. <laughs> okay. Okay. But then he came, though, to write a new covenant even concerning them. You, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. 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 So it's essential to understand some history. Yes. With some things. Yes. So that you can that. be able to speak to it accurately. That's right. And it doesn't become an argument. Okay. 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 Because a lot of people do not know and will, ref they will argue with you that Jesus was not a Jew. And he was. <laughs> but he came to write a new law concerning them. So you, if someone can say, you are worshiping Jesus and Jesus was a Jew and Jews didn't even, the Jews rejected the Holy Spirit and you are worshiping, following a Jesus and he was a Jew. So how the, and that's what, and so I should be able to say, he came so that he can rectify that? He came in order to establish a new covenant for the Jewish race because the Jews are considered his bride. He came to establish a new covenant. Right. Okay. Hence why you'll recognize that, and this is why we did the genealogy, and that is you can trace him through Mary, okay. but you cannot trace him through Joseph. That's right. And that's because Joseph was not his father. He was his grandfather. Was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which hence sents the new covenant. Okay. Thank you. Um, Pastor, for, with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, um, do children need to have the infilling of the Holy Spirit? And if so, what age would be appropriate? Age of accountability, which means when they're at the point that they can understand. Okay. Um, God the Father, Jesus the Son, Holy Spirit the Comforter, when they can understand the importance of 
baptism, when you're able to explain that to them and they understand and they can make the connection, when they're also at a point where they understand right, wrong, that right brings about rewards, that wrong consequences, when they're at that age, that is the time. And as a parent, is it okay for children to mimic um, the in, in feeling of the Holy Spirit or would you would rather them not to do that? No, they shouldn't be mimicking it and that's because the Holy Spirit is, and I'm glad you brought that up because it jogs my mind, is that um, some people think that it's a tongue or it's a language that you mimic or you practice. Mm -mm. It's not like learning French 101. Okay? The Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit, one, is a person, right. and when he enters, he enters and he infills you with his tongue, which means it's not like a natural tongue that you would learn. It's not an earthly language that you would learn. Like, if you, anybody in here ever take Spanish? Yes. I'm not going to ask you if you remember any of it, mm -hmm. okay? However, you had to learn that, right. Right? right? And you started out with a few words at a time, right? Okay, when the Holy Spirit enters, he enters completely fluent. Wow, thank you, Lord. All right, which means you don't practice it at home until you get it. That's why in Acts, you'll notice that Peter, when he would pray over people and he would lay his hands on them, it says they spoke fluently. Do you, okay, so like you're learning to speak a language. I understand the better you get at speaking that language, um, it becomes more, mm, I guess it flows a little faster. So could that be the same? So you, you're beginning and you receive the Holy Spirit, mm, let's say two years ago. And now here you are. It, it's, does it sound different? Can it, can it sound different yet be the same? Even though you receive it, it will always be fluent. Fluent, I understand. Where the person has to, if if anything, they perfect themselves in, is activating the Holy Spirit's voice, and that's because He relies on your vocal cords to speak. All right. So if you don't ever open your mouth, uh -huh. then He's never going to speak. Okay. So you have to make it a point throughout the course of the day to make yourself speak. Because he cannot, he needs utterance. He requires vocal cords. So just as I'm thinking right now, one, two, three, you don't know I'm thinking one, two, three, unless I say one, two, three, okay? Only thing is, is this transaction doesn't happen, tongues that is, doesn't happen in the head. It, come, it happens in the heart, all right? So it is fully perfect and developed. So when one receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, they can be just as fluent in their tongues upon the initial influing, infilling as I am. Okay, right. Amen, amen, amen. I, I just remember receiving, and it sounded like an utterance years ago to me. That's in my own head, I guess. It sounded like an utterance. And now it sounds more like, um, I don't want to say a language, um, I don't know. It just sounds better. <laughs> I don't know what the well, word. You're also more confident in it. You've perfected yourself in it, and you pray more often. Okay. In it. So that's what. Okay. okay. So it's you perfecting yourself in the gift because the gift is. Because gift is already perfect. Hallelujah. Amen. It's perfect, and so it's never going to be on the gift. It's always going to be on the person. Right. Because it's fully fluent. He says that the Holy Spirit, he is as rivers of living water. Yes. Now when he says rivers of living water, to uh -huh. me it's almost like it's violent. Okay, it's, and that's the way he is with everyone. So if you have someone like stuttering and putting out a syllable here and there, that's not it. He comes as a river. That answer your question? Okay, thank you for clarifying part of Jasmine's question because she actually asked part of my question, so thank you. 
So I guess my question would be, is that why, since it comes from the heart and not our head, is that why, like, whenever you're trying to, like, think your prayers? Because, like, I don't know, I'm a planner. Like, I try to plan out what I'm going to say and, like, make it sound all nice and, like, the these and thous and formal and everything. And then when I'm praying in my heavenly language, I can't, I'm not thinking at all. And I used to think I wasn't doing it right because I couldn't think of anything to say. I would just be saying things. So is that kind of, like, why you can't think about it or, like, plan out what you're going to say because it's not coming from the head, it's coming from the heart? You can't think about what you're going to say, and that's because it's the Holy Spirit who is praying. You just have to open up your mouth so that you can speak through you, but it's the Holy Spirit who is praying. Where the mind comes in is that the Holy Spirit can, as I'm praying, let's say, you know, tonight, and I set aside some time to pray, and the Holy Spirit pops Diana in my mind. I think Diana, and then ki horaba akasi imoho horekeshe elemaha korobo seheda makati isi. And I'm praying a perfect prayer concerning you without knowing any details. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that is what the mind is for. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Or you can think about a situation, mm -hmm. whether concerning you or someone else. Mm -hmm. All the Holy Spirit has to do is pop a name, situation in your mind, you pray in your heavenly language, then you'll know exactly what you're praying for. So it's the yeah. perfect Hallelujah. prayer. <laughs> Not to mention, when you pray in your heavenly language, you're also building your faith, which is the God faith that you need. Okay? So... I, because I understand that I am a son of God and I am representing the kingdom of heaven here on this earth, then I make it a point to pray in my heavenly language and I just about completely omit English. Mm -hmm. The only time I use English is when I'm just reinforcing what the word says about me or a situation. Okay? Yes, I do. <laughs> And you'll, you'll know you're growing in that area, and that's because there have been multiple mornings where I have woken up talking in tongues. Yes. So I was doing it when I was sleeping. Okay? So that's the connection that the Holy Spirit is wanting, where he can communicate with you whether you are asleep or awake. <laughs> he always has your attention. And that's what I love about it. Okay? So... The Holy Spirit is perfect, and his gift of tongues is perfect. It's just we have to perfect ourselves in the gift. Yes. Okay, it's kind of off topic, but not really to a degree. So when we have dreams, because I know some people probably dream often, and some people are like, oh, I don't have dreams, or whatever, but when you have dreams, because I know we're not, you know, not to get too deep into the interpretation or assuming that it's a vision or that you're prophesying anything. Um, how do we figure out whether or not our dreams have any actual meaning um, or purpose in our lives? Because I know there are certain dreams that I've had where it's like things that haven't necessarily happened yet but seem like it's super real. Like how do you decipher if your dreams have any context and meaning into your personal life at all. You can consult the Holy Spirit about it first, mm -hmm. um, or if you're really, really not sure and you're concerned enough, um, you can ask me, you can ask the elders, either Elder Ron, Elder Bernie. Um, however, understand this, and that is, who has access to the body? God. God and? Okay. Who has access to the soul? Okay, let me skip it. Who has access to the spirit? Holy Spirit. And only the Holy Spirit. Okay. Jesus has The soul. Jesus. Okay, and that's because what component is a part of the soul? The mind, all right? 
So God has access to the mind, yeah. the adversary has access to the mind. Right. Now, what I have noticed, and that's because he tried it on me, all right? And that is, if he can't succeed in your mind when you're awake, he will try and get you when you're asleep, okay? And then you sometimes, well, I'm waking up and I'm going, <laughs> However, because I know this truth, yes. it doesn't bother me. Right. Okay? So I just cast it down and then I keep on going. Yeah. All right? Now, those dreams that are of significance, the Holy Spirit will tell me. Yeah. He will immediately tell me. All right? And then he'll even let me know what I should expect thereafter, or if there's something that I should do, or if there's a message I should convey to someone, or whatever. So we have to understand that both have access to the mind. So both have access to the dreams. You have to rely on the Holy Spirit to show you where to put your focus. And don't let crazy stuff trip you up. <laughs> I'm serious because he will try it and he'll try and haunt you with it like for days. All right, but mm -mm. Um, and this is why renewing the mind is important and that's because you'll find that the more often you renew your mind and suggestion, um, when you go to sleep, put the Bible on. Put a Bible app on. Let it run all night. All right. He has less access then. Wherever you have opportunity to keep that word pouring into your mind, pouring into your spirit, and, it, and I'm telling you how this thing works, and that's because there are things that I have said to people in ministering to them, or maybe even some of the teachings here, and I go back and I, I get ministered to just by my own teachings. I'm like, who is that? <laughs> um, but it's because though, when I put, for instance, the Bible app on, scripture is getting into me and so I'm speaking out of heart, not out of head. And so then when I say something, I'm like, and then the Holy Spirit will say, I'll show you where it is. But see, it was already in there. It was already in there, okay? But this is something that we have to continue to do until Jesus comes. Don't think that you're ever so good that, you know, I don't have to do any more of that. I'm set. <laughs> do it till Jesus comes. Yeah? Okay. Borrowing any Holy Ghost changes. I'm going to talk about fraternities and sororities next week. Okay? Thank you all for coming. Hope you learned something.